anyway, uh, we're going to be going into Acts chapter 7. And uh, <clears throat> this is piggybacking off of last week. If you remember last week, uh, uh, we saw that uh, uh, the Jewish believers, uh, their widows were getting food. But the Hellenistic or the Greek believers, their widows were not getting food. And so uh, Peter came up with an idea. Peter and the rest of the apostles came up with the, with the idea that uh, they should get seven men to serve. And we found out these were the first deacons. And one of those men was Stephen. And he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And uh, no one could win a debate with him because he was uh, so full of the Spirit and wisdom. And as we go into this today, Stephen is talking with the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders. And this is his testimony. Uh, and he'll go over Israel's history and prophecies in the Old Testament he's going to talk about. But the most important thing we're going to see from this is Stephen is the very first Christian martyr. He's the very first Christian to die for his faith. Um, and uh, there's a lot we can learn from this. Now, this is going to be a very long read, uh, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, and there might be some things in here you don't understand. Uh, there might be, uh, if you're reading along, grab a pen uh, or a pencil and circle some things that you like and what you don't like and things you don't understand and questions you have. And uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Does that sound good, guys? Yeah, so, sounds great. Okay, okay. So let's get started. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 1. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into, the, into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them four hundred years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him, and he rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all the household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, uh, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, seventy-five persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem, and laid in the tomb that Abraham 
had bought for the sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. But as it as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit the brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were uh, quarreling, and he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, when you are brothers, uh, sorry, men, you are brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him inside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, when, when forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he drew near to look. There came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. <clears throat> then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for forty years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt saying to Aaron, Make us, make for us gods who will go before us. As for uh, this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Molech and the star of your god Rephan, uh, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as, as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they disposed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find the dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as a prophet says. 
heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by the angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So, before I start my questioning, most of this chapter that we read, what was Stephen doing? Do you know what Stephen was doing? He was trying to spread the word, was he not? Uh, well, kind of. Who did he start with? Do you remember the guy he started with when he started talking? The high priest. Uh, no, he was actually, he actually started with the guy named Abraham. Uh, you, were, you, I, I see what you're talking about. Uh, the high priest said, "Are these things so?" And then um, Stephen starts his stories, his story here. Yeah, and he yeah, starts Abraham. talking about a guy named Abraham, which is Abraham is the father of Judaism and Christianity. Now, he talked about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob the patriarchs, which are the sons of Jacob. He talked about Moses. He talked about the prophets. He talked about David. So what, um, what Stephen just did is he gave the history of the Bible in that short chapter from Genesis chapter 12 all the way through the Old Testament. He summed it up in that chapter, the history of the Old Testament. Pretty interesting, eh? So, now that we have that, go ahead, Will. No, it was just, yeah, yeah. It was just like, a, what do you call that, a, uh, a minute version of, the, yeah, yeah, the whole story. That's right, the Reader's Digest version of the Old Testament. That's what he just did. He gave Israel's history. So now that we know what he was doing, what? And then we see that. Well, we'll we'll get into this into his stoning later tonight. When we look at Israel's history, and as he was talking about it, what did you like about that? Like how all the, uh, pretty much all the stories about, like, why each one did what they did is because basically, like, God had told them to do what they're going to do, so they did it. That's right. That's right, Will. Anyone else? What did you like about this? There was a lot to consume in this, especially if you don't know the Old Testament stories. 
there's a lot to consume. But is there anyone else that liked anything up about what we read here? Okay, is there something you did not like in this whole chapter there? Before we get into that, can I tell you what I did like? And I'll tell you why I liked it. Yeah. Okay. So Stephen gives the history of the Old Testament. And then verse 54 and following. This is really interesting. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to stop here. Um, when we go back to chapter 6, and the seven that were chosen to serve, it says, um, I'm just, verse 3. Of chapter 6, it says, Therefore, brothers, pick out among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So we see that that uh, Stephen had a lifestyle of being full of the Holy Spirit. Now, being full of the Holy Spirit, that is a nautical term, like a sailing term. Okay. Uh, we see uh, in uh, in Ephesians, it says, "Do uh, Paul says, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the with the Holy Spirit." This doesn't mean act all goofy and drunk. It means don't let alcohol control you. Let the Holy Spirit fill you like it would fill a sail. Okay. And be and, and and empower you that way, and give you propulsion, the way that that the wind would catch a sail on a on a sailboat or a schooner. And we see right here. It says, "But he was full of the Holy Spirit, and he gazed into heaven, and saw." The glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Do you know that you cannot see Jesus without the Holy Spirit being in you? Amen. It it makes is sense. The, yeah. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal. Jesus to you. So now, a major question is, how do we get filled with the Spirit? Like, when we become believers, the Holy Spirit indwells us. But how do we live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit? Do you guys know? The Ten Commandments. Oh, Tamara, that is a great answer. Um, now, let me ask you something. Uh, d does anyone else think that Tamara is right on this? In these times, no. Okay. Before, maybe. Okay, and why In do you say times, that, Tina? Well, because we live by grace now. So... Um, yet that doesn't mean we can go out and do whatever we want. It means we still have to live a Christian life, but we don't live by the law now. We live by grace. Okay. Okay. Um, James, now uh, the Psalms say, uh, Psalm 119 says, I delight in your law. Your word is like honey on my lips. The law is very good. God's law is good. 
Uh, in Exodus, uh, I think it's chapter 23, he, uh, God tells Moses to tell the Israelites, make sure that the people follow my law so they do not sin against me. Now. But it's impossible not to sin. Okay. I hear <laughs> That's why you. I say, you know what I'm saying. Okay. I, I hear you. Now. Okay. Now, let me explain this for a second. Is God just being a tyrant? Saying, don't you dare sin against me or I'll smite you. No. Okay, so no. what's God saying? I like to bring it down to what, uh, how Jesus put it, is love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so um, was Jesus just making stuff up on the spot there, Will? No, because that is ultimately what it is about. Like, there's no, there's nothing else. Just like you said before, like everything else, all these other things, like, you know, who's doing what, blah, 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 blah. It's all, like Paul said, it's all rubbish. What yeah, matters? Yeah, Philippians chapter 3. Yeah, so yeah. Jesus is quoting what we call the Shema. It's Deuteronomy 6.4. And he's saying, hear, O Israel. Like, hear. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So Jesus isn't making this up on the spot. He's quoting quote the Old Testament. So if that's the time of grace, then is not the Old Testament time of grace also? And, and no, Tamara, no. Tamara I, I'm taking the long way around your answer here, sweetheart, okay? No, because um, Jesus died after after the law was put into place. Is okay. that uh, who do you can, get what who, I'm getting? Who can about? read? Uh, who can read uh, for me Romans six twenty three? But when I when you read Romans six twenty three, I only want you to read the first half of it. Go right to the semicolon, and that's it. Who can read that for me? I got her. Go for it. For the wages of sin is death. Stop there. Thank you. Oh. The wages of sin is death. So when God is saying, make sure that they hear this law and that they follow it, why does he not want them to sin against him? Leads to death. It leads yeah, to death. death. Okay. Yeah. Now, what what does the second half of six twenty three say there, Will? But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. So here, what the law does here, Tamara, is it shows us we are sinners. And that we are spiritually dead. And so we don't, a lot of people think you, you can get, you, you can take this Bible and become very legalistic with it and say, okay, I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do this in order to earn God's love. Or I have to do things just right. The answer is no. You got it wrong. Now, should we live a life of sin? No. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, Jesus tells us in the book of John, I've come to give you life. Just not life, but life to the abundance. Now, If the wages of sin is death, 
And God says, teach them these laws so they do not sin against me. What is God's primary concern for your life? That it'll be eternal in the end. That's right. He doesn't want you to die. Okay. But all of us have sinned. Can you read, uh, Will, can you read Romans 3.23 for me, please? Uh, Romans 3. 3.23. Copy. Okay. For all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yeah. For all have sinned and, and, and have fallen short of God's glorious standard or have fallen short of the glory of God. I like that one better. Meaning, meaning, God created us in his image and his likeness. God is glorious, but because we have sinned, we have diminished God's glory. And we're like a broken mirror that doesn't work and we turn out to be garbage and so now we see that the wages of sin is death it's a spiritual death it's a ultimately a physical death and it's an eternal death where we live eternally in a state of death through punishment in hell God says, teach them my law so they don't sin against me. If you don't know God's law, what's the chances you're going to sin against him? 100%. 100%. Now, do I still sin? Yes. The difference is I hate my sin. And the reason why I hate my sin is that, have you guys ever experienced this? Like a lot of you have become Christians within this year. Before you became believers and you sinned, did it bother you? Nope. No. Now Now. I think about everything. Everything I do, I think about. Yeah. Now. I'm very sure that you have sinned at least once since you've become a believer. How do you feel inside now when you sin? Guilty. Sad. Guilty, sad. Anything else? Like I need to say I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. I feel dirty inside i yeah. i feel yeah. sometimes numb or hollow i feel remorse i can't hear you lucas remorse remorse yeah and that's the holy spirit being grieved in you but what did god tell moses to tell us in Exodus 23. Teach them this law that they will not sin against me. If you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to read God's Word a lot. And you need to study God's word a lot, just not on Wednesday nights, every day. God, I'll, I'll take you to where I am in Exodus right now. Like, if you could see that, that's Exodus for me. Look at that. And if you saw the page before, like, look at this. Like, I study. I study a lot. Now, here's what happens when you study God's Word. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, tells us that God's Word is 
living and active, and it's sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing down through the soul and the spirit and through bones and marrow. And so what happens is a couple things when you really study God's word is it convicts you, number one. It brings you to repentance. And then because it's the word of God that breathed out, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that the uh, that um, all scripture is breathed out by God. To be breathed out in, in Greek, the, the word for breath, wind, and spirit is the same word. It's pneuma. It's spirited out. It's breathed out. It's talked out by God. And so this is God speaking to you when you read the word. And so number one, it convicts you. Number two, it inspires you. Number three, it brings you life. And number four, it causes you to pray to God. And so how did Stephen get full of the Holy Spirit? Number one, he studied the word of God. You can tell through this little sermonette that he gave. He knew the history of Israel. I mean, he knew that because he studied his Bible. And he was speaking to the leaders of Israel. And he, everything is 100% accurate according to the Old Testament. And he went from basically uh, Genesis chapter 12 all the way through the Old Testament. And hit the highlights. And so he was a man of the word. And he was a man of prayer. And because of that. Who did Stephen see. When he was full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus. He saw Jesus. There's an old hymn. And guys, go search it out. It's called Be Thou My Vision. And it goes, Be Thou My Vision, O God of my heart. Listen to it. Are you reading the Bible? Because it is your Christian duty to do it. Or are you studying the Bible because you want life? Life to the, to the abundance and ultimately you want to see Jesus. I have been trying to study it every morning but i'm in a place right now where it's all these names the oh. father of so and so the father of oh, what you are in yeah, and... chapter five of genesis no um i I'd, I'd have to look up which one it is but it's the father of so and so and the father of so and so and the father of and the whole chapter is like that, and it's a long chapter. Look at Matthew. Are you, in uh, Matthew. are you in Matthew chapter 1? I'm really sorry, guys. I don't know. Okay, that it's is fine. somewhere in the Old Testament. Okay. Okay, so those genealogies are actually very important. Okay, so help me with that, because okay. they don't mean anything to me. They it's may, just okay. frustrating. Um. I want to give you an analogy. One of my favorite movies, movie trilogies, is Back to the Future. Have you guys ever seen Back to the Future? Yeah. Okay. 
Have you? Are you like me? Have you seen it more than once? No. <laughs> okay. I've seen it. I bet you I've seen it like a hundred times. I don't know. I'm not kidding. Like what? But every time, and, and you guys, but I'm I'm using Back to the Future. You guys might have a movie that you watch all the time. Have you ever picked up little th things extra every time you watch it? It's like, oh, I didn't see that before. That's okay. That ties in over there. Have you guys ever, ever done that? Yeah, on the chosen. Yeah. Okay. So, what is not making sense to you right now, Gina? As you work work through the Bible, things will start to make sense a little bit. I'll give you an example. <coughs> I wrote a short book that I do not have published yet, um, and it is based off the book of Numbers. Numbers is an extremely boring book. It's full of numbers. It's a bunch of senses, a few cool stories, but it's boring. But I came across a guy in numbers. Now, this little book that I wrote, it's if it turns into a booklet about this tall, you know, and about that wide, it'll probably be about 40, 50 pages. Ran into a guy named Nashon. N A H S H O N. And I circled that name. And I thought, huh. I bet you. I've read that name before. I think he's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So on to Matthew chapter 1. Lo and behold, he is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So I thought, I better pay attention to this name. So we find out in the book of Numbers, and I'm really going off track. I'm taking a big rabbit trail just to help you out here, Gina. Find out that he is the chief of the tribe of Judah. Interesting. Now, as I keep reading through the Bible, I come to, I believe it's, is it First Chronicles or Second Chronicles? Let me see here. I'm in second I was going to tell you, it is Chronicles that oh. I, the, that is the one. And I think it's 15 through 58 or something. Okay. That this one here is in chapter two that I'm looking for. The genealogy of David. Now, this is really cool. A bunch of names. But listen to this. These are, and we're going to get down to chapter, uh, to verse 10. And this is awesome. These are the sons of Israel. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Uh, these three, Bathshua, the Canaanite, bore to him. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of, uh, of the Lord, and he put him to death. His daughter-in-law, Tamar, uh, Tamar, Tamar, also bore him uh, Perez and Zerah. Judah had five sons in all. The sons of Perez, does this sound boring? It's boring. But let's get to yeah. something. Let's get to something here. The sons of Perez, Hezron and Hamuel. The sons of Zerah, Zimri, Ethan, Heman, Calcol, and Dara. Five in all. Is this boring? Yeah, it's boring. Let's keep on going. The sons of Carmi, Achan, the troubler of Israel. Ooh, that's interesting. Pay attention to him. Uh, you'll read about him in uh, Joshua chapter Seven. Achan, the troubler of Israel, who broke faith in the matter of the devoted things, and Ethan's son was Azariah, the son of Hezron, that were born to him, Jerhamil, Ram, and Cholabai. Now listen to this. 
Ram fathered Aminadab, and Aminadab fathered Nashon, prince of the sons of Judah. So now we have this guy named Nashon. We're just reading names. We find out he's a prince of the sons of Judah. Here's something really cool. Psalm 68. Take you over there. Psalm 68. Uh, where are we? Here we are. The verses uh, 26 and 27. It says, Bless God in the great congregation, the Lord of who, uh, the Lord, O you who are of Israel's fountain, there is Benjamin, the least of them in the land, the princes of Judah in their throng, the princes of Zebulun, and the princes of uh, Naphtali. You know, all throughout Scripture, there's only one prince in the Old Testament that has a name. That's Nashon. So we pay attention to that. So we see that Nashon is the chief, the leader of the tribe of Judah. He's the prince of the tribe of Judah. We also see, as we go through numbers, just reading, circle these things, he was the first one to offer the consecrating sacrifice for Judah and for Israel for the temple or for, for the tabernacle. Then we see something else. We see that Nashon led the whole tribe of Israel through the desert. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Aaron, the high priest. It was Nashon. Then we see something. Israel sins badly. And God is going to kill them all. And he says, no. Instead of killing them all, I want you to take all the chiefs of the tribes and I want you to hang them on a tree. And that word hang means to hang and pierce on a tree. Yeah, I, I think I read that somewhere already. That, that's in the book of Numbers. So now we see something here. Nashon is foreshadowing Jesus Christ. We see that he is the leader of Judah. Jesus comes from Judah. We see that he's the prince of Judah. Jesus is the king of Israel. We see that he offered the first consecrating sacrifice for the tabernacle. Jesus is the sacrifice for the church. We see that uh, he, fought, he led Israel through the desert. Okay? And the way that he led Israel through the desert is he followed the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We see in 1 Corinthians, that was Jesus, the cloud and the fire. You see that in 1 Corinthians. And then we see that Nashon, because he was a chief of the tribe of Judah, he was basically crucified for the sins of the tribe of Judah. Just like Jesus was crucified. For the sins of the world. And when you read all of this, it actually gets tied up together in Psalm 68, where I just read, and then it goes into Isaiah and it goes into Matthew, and it's just amazing. But you can't get there until you read through all these little boring parts, and then you'll hit a little story and a little, I read that name before. And then if you're an anti like me, you don't know where you read it, so you Google it, and it pops up. And then you get to find it again. Okay. Okay. And Thank so you. Yeah. That is the long way around the story, uh, like yeah. your answer there. Okay, uh, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> Gina, I love taking the long way around. 
I really do. Okay. Because I think that it's a more full answer instead yeah. of, well, you just got to push through. No, like this is why you want to push through. This is the kind of gold that you find. Because sometimes okay. when you have questions, we need answers too. That's right. That's right. Like, uh, I'm sure, like, like for example, um, you, you, you read about, um, oh, goodness. I, I always want to say Hophni and Phineas, but that was Samuel's sons. Um, I'm looking for Aaron's sons. Uh, I got to go to Leviticus. Nadab and Abihu, okay? God killed Nadab and Abihu in the tabernacle because they offered strange fight. They went against how God prescribed sacrifices to happen, and he killed them. And this is very interesting because every genealogy you read of the priestly line the story of Nadab and Abihu is in every one of those stories, in every one of those genealogies. And so when you know the story, you know what's going on. So Thank you. I digress. We totally got off track, but that's my fault. But I hope that you guys learned something. Anyway. So let's go back to Acts. Acts chapter 7. So now, here is Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, and he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He cries out, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. They killed him because of the testimony he said, which was Israel's history, and that you killed the prophets and you killed Jesus, just like your fathers killed the prophets. And they... And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Who do you think this young man named Saul is? Is that like Solomon and Gomorrah? No, no. Uh, that's uh, 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 Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities uh, in the book of Genesis. Good try, though, Kara. Does anyone know who this young man named Saul might be? He's somebody's son. <laughs> Definitely somebody's and I, son. I want to say a name, but I don't Didn't know. Didn't Saul become a right. king? A king Saul? Okay, so great answer. There was a king Saul. He was the first king of Israel. So this is not the same Saul, but the king of the first king of Israel, Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin, and we see here that this Saul is named after the first king because this Saul comes from the tribe of Benjamin also. Does anyone know who this guy might be? For whatever reason, I thought I've heard Saul is Paul. I don't know. You are correct. You are correct. And in two weeks, we're going to see that Saul was a Pharisee, and so they laid his clothes at, at the feet of Saul, which is Paul. So Paul witnessed the very first Christian martyr. This is the same Paul that wrote most of the New Testament. And as we're reading Acts, you're going to see that Paul is in most of Acts. From chapter 9 on, it's mostly Paul. And what we see oh. here in in it goes by Paul or Saul. Paul would be his Greek name. Saul is his Jewish name. And what we see is 
Paul was one of the, or Saul was one of those people who was not a believer yet. And he was there basically, basically certifying that Stephen was killed as a blasphemer. Saul is what we so would thumb. call today a Jewish terrorist. And next week, we are going to see some crazy stuff with Saul. And then the next week is going to see some amazing stuff with Saul. But let me ask you something. What did Stephen say? What did he pray right before he died? To forgive them. Why? I can't see. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Go, go, gadget eyes, Gina. Yeah, no, yeah, I know. It's terrible. Was he the one that was stoned? Stephen was stoned. Paul was the oh. official witness to the stoning. And it says, he wow. said, and they were, and yeah. as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my, uh, my, Receive my spirit, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And he, when he said this, he fell asleep. Don't hold it against him. What did Jesus pray as they were yelling at him, yeah. crucify him, forgive, crucify them. him. forgive them, because they don't know what they do? Yeah. Who was, was Stephen acting more like a man or more like Jesus as he was Jesus. Being, Jesus. Jesus. Now, as I kind of foreshadowed with Saul and Paul, and Saul was there, did God end up forgiving Saul? Yes. Yes, he did. Now, let me ask you a question. I don't have the definite answer on this. But if, if Stephen was arrogant and saying, you dirty buggers, you're going to go to hell for what you're doing. You think? Do you think that might have turned Saul off of Christ? I don't know. Could have. Hundred percent. Could have. Would turn him off of it. Of do course. You think, do, you, do you think that maybe him praying that might have pricked Saul's own heart a bit? Sorry, can you say that one more time? You think that Stephen praying what he prayed, Father, forgive them. Yeah. Do you think that maybe that might have been like a seed being planted? Yes, absolutely. Do you know that Paul ended up writing one thing? third of the New Testament. Where would we be without Paul? Yeah, I think that changed Paul's life. Well, we're going to see a lot about Paul in the near future. But how we respond to persecution matters. And I don't know if you guys have experienced what I have experienced. The majority of my non-Christian family wants nothing to do. They hate me. Uh, 
I'm late getting here, but I've experienced this already. Have you? Oh, absolutely, my oldest boy. I haven't been feeling good, so I, I, uh, I'm here late. I apologize. That's fine. I'm recording um, yeah. it, Joe. So I'll send it to you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've spent yeah. two days in bed, so. Yeah. Um, my oldest boy basically belittles me, and it, I think it's just because he doesn't understand, but it really hurts. Yeah. So I pray for him. Yeah. And what I'm saying is how we respond to persecution matters. People who are not Christians will hate you because you're not one of them anymore. But how we respond to persecution matters because we don't know who God's going to save. But if we can plant that seed, even to the point of persecution where they're going to kill us, that matters. Amen. Yeah. I face that daily, man. Yeah. <laughs> and no, I'm I, still smiling. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Because when I was in the oil sands, when I was in construction, I would get it all the time. But God in his grace had always allowed me to start Bible studies. And people were getting saved. Amen. That's so, what it's about. That's it. That's it. So that was that long chapter summed up. And we, we really took the long way around to get here. So what do you think we should do with what we've learned tonight? Hey, Lucas, you're at work, yeah? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. For the people who came in late, but my, like myself, and um, I apologize for that. I'm driving still. Yeah. Hey, Kara. I'm so hey. close to home. I'm so close yeah. to home. Kara, uh, <laughs> if Mindy's on here too, we need to talk about your baptisms tonight, okay? It's very important that we talk about them tonight. So, I'll... Uh... okay. Yeah, I can't hear you. Give me a call when you're at home. Anyway, what, how do we apply this to our lives from what we learned tonight? How do we put it in practice? Study our Bibles and learn from others' mistakes. Yeah, just study the Bibles. That we're reading Stop, about like, in the study. Bible. And, yeah. you know, guys, I want to tell you, your personal study of the Bible is going to be like Gina. You're not going to get it all at once. You're going to get to those boring parts. You're going to get in so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so begat, so-and-so. Work through it because what's going into you will finally start connecting the dots throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. And you're gonna, it'll take your breath away, really. Study your Bible. That's great. What else? What What else can we do, guys? Sometimes it's that fine grain of sand of information that connects all the dots and gives you the biggest mind blowing experience of your life. That's right. Like you'll be reading the Bible. I want to be very clear with you guys here. Have you guys ever been reading the Bible and like a verse like jumps out at you? It's like, I've never seen that before. And you just can't help but focus on that verse and it kind of takes your breath away. Have you guys experienced that yet? Quite a few times, yeah. 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 Okay. This is my first time reading it. So sometimes yeah. something will okay. pop out. That's awesome. Now, we, we see in 2 Timothy 3.16, for all scripture is breathed out by God. And is profitable for rebuke, for reproof, 
for correcting and, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may become thoroughly equipped for every good work. So since the word of God is breathed out, all scripture is breathed out or spirited out by God, whose words are these? God's. God's. So when you see that verse that just jumps out at you, Who's speaking to you? He's speaking directly. Yeah. God is speaking directly to you. Now, here's a question. Is God speaking directly to you just so you can get little butterflies in your inside? No, I think it's so you pay attention. Pay attention. Because what... Why does God want you to pay attention, Gina? Well, sometimes with myself, it's been because these are things I need to improve myself. And I realize that. Okay. So according sometimes... To Exodus 23, you know, according to Exodus 23. Teach them my laws so they do not sin against me. He's trying to get your attention so he can save you from spiritual death so you follow his way and That's get away right. from Satan's way. That's right. Now, now, I want to clarify some things because there'll be people watching this afterwards and saying, oh, you're teaching and you, you lose your salvation. I'm not. I'm not. The wages of sin is death. Once you become a, a believer, you can't lose your salvation. But you also got to remember, you can't lose what you never had in the first place. And there's a lot of parables that are showing the difference between true and false salvation. Okay, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about it all the time. And Paul tells us in Corinthians, he says, uh, test yourselves to see if you're truly in the faith. Tells us, I think, in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I've been a Christian long enough that I have gone through times of sin where I don't want to read the Bible. And I can tell you, I feel dead inside. Doesn't mean I lost my salvation. But it brings a type of spiritual death when you are not feasting on the word of life. That's number one. God is trying to give you life. Life to the abundance. He wants to give you more and more and more. Uh, John chapter 1 says, And from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Let that thing sink in. Jesus is eternal. It, it's actually mind-blowing when you think about it. The second you thing know what is, happened today? Oops, go, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, it's your turn. Go ahead. This is really bugging me. Can I just share? Yes. <laughs> I was with my grandson at Walmart, and he was scanning stuff through and stole something. Uh oh And I said, and I was paying. And I said, Davin, you can't do that. And so we kind of left the store and now it's really bugging me. And I want to talk to him and say, Davin, that was wrong and go pay for it tomorrow. Is that how, how, how I mean, old this is, is Davin? Really... How old is Davin? 19, 19. Okay. So you have an amazing gospel opportunity with Davin. Yeah. Yeah. Which okay. I want. Okay, so this is the way I would look at it. Davin, you know you stole. Okay. Uh -huh. 19 year old, he's going to think this way. They're a major corporation. They're not going to. Yep. It. Pretty much. Yep. The way I put it is something like this. Do you know the story of Adam and Eve? Most people do, right? Yeah. 
what did God, what was the only law God had? Don't not to eat, eat the apple. The, don't eat the fruit or don't eat the apple. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. just one thing. You could eat up anything else except for that. And they ate of the apple. Let's just call it the apple. I don't know what it is. Let's just call it an apple. Was there anything in that apple to kill them? Yeah. No. There was nothing in the apple that killed them, but that they did it killed them. <laughs> why? Because why? Because they sinned. Because they sinned against who? God. God. Mm hmm. And this is where you can take it back to Ro uh, Romans uh, three twenty three. Davin, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. What does that mean, Davin? That means that God had a standard for us, and that standard was to be as glorious as he is. And the moment we sin, we shatter that glory to where there's nothing left of it, and it's just muck and mire and manure. Mm -hmm. And Romans 6, yeah. the wages of sin is death. To sin against God in any manner brings you death. Spiritual death, physical death, dead on the inside. Davin, you're going to deal with stuff that you don't want to deal with. 623 of Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You can say, show what Jesus did for him on the cross. He paid your penalty. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. doesn't want to hear much about churchy stuff. Well, I try, but I'm very well, cautious. Do you know why he doesn't want... Let me ask you something here, Gina. Did these Jewish people in chapter 7 of Acts want to hear much about this Jesus stuff? No. No. Does it matter? I still have to do it because I feel terrible. Here's I the... feel terrible. Can you... Gina... Yes. Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 33 are almost identical chapters. I'm going to take you there. I'm sorry, guys. I'm taking all Jason's no, time. Here. No, that's fine. Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 33 are almost identical chapters. Now listen to this. And then we're going to take it back to the book of Acts. Okay? Okay. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16. And at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. Number one, if you're hearing from God from the Bible, God wants you to tell it to other people. Okay. If I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his sin, for, sorry, for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. What's God saying? You're responsible for his blood if you do not warn him. Okay. Verse well, 19, I've been uh, Hold on, Gina. Let's keep going. Okay. But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked ways, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will be, but you have delivered your soul. Okay. Now, let's go to the book of Acts. And gotta... I passed it. Acts chapter 20. 
Now, Paul uh, is in Ephesus. He's planted this church, and it's time for him to say goodbye to the elders because he's moving on. And he says in verse 25 of chapter 20 of Acts, And now, behold, I know that none of you, none among you, whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom, will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. These people in Ephesus were mostly Gentile believers. Ezekiel, God's telling Ezekiel, speak to the people of Israel, and Paul's taking this saying, speak to the people of the world. And he's saying, if I, I warned all of you and I gave you the whole counsel of God, and therefore I'm free of the blood of anyone. Your blood's on your own head if you don't believe. I shared with as many people as I could. So when God gives you a word from the Bible, you need to share it with others. Sorry. Yeah, I, I know this. It it is. It's been bothering me all night how I'm going to handle this. So this is. We're going to pray for you right now, Gina. And you're going to pray. And Davin is his name. Yeah. Let's pray for Davin, Father. Um, sharing the gospel is scary. We know that we come under demonic fear when we try to share the gospel because Satan doesn't want that to happen. So, Father, I'm praying that first of all that you would give. Gina, the courage to share the gospel with Davin. Second, Father, we ask that in your grace and mercy that you would open Davin's heart to your word. He may not become a believer right away, but I pray that that word would be planted and that you would save his soul. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Amen.